Welcome everyone, this is Dr. Mercola, and today we are joined by Carol Vanderstoop, who shows a career in dental hygiene over one in dentistry because she valued prevention over repair. And she's been doing this for 25 years, and actually, interestingly, was asked to go back to a dental school, but she chose not to because she really enjoys this portion of uh, dental care much better. And uh, we'll be discussing that, I'm sure, in our interview. But uh, she actually wrote a book, which I've read, which is uh, called Mouth Matters, and it, it discusses whole body health from a dental perspective and advanced forms of dental diagnosis and treatment that uh, we should all be requesting. So thank you and welcome for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This is a very exciting opportunity to uh, talk about more modern dental techniques that have not really been introduced to the public. Yeah, they're certainly not widely recommended. So why don't you tell, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you first became interested in this aspect of, of uh, dental health? Because it's not a common passion that people have, but obviously it's clearly one of yours. You're exactly right. Um, in fact, when I wrote the first edition of Mouth Matters, it was all about how gum disease affects heart disease, mm -hmm. um, diabetes, stroke risk, all of those degenerative diseases of the body. But I wasn't all that interested in teeth. What I started to realize as the question of root canals and breaking down teeth started to surface was that if a tooth does break down or catastrophically fail, you're facing the same issue about introducing germs back into the body. So um, as a result of having written the first edition, it was wonderful for me to be able to be introduced to some of the top dental researchers, clinicians, uh, people who are really trying to start a revolution in dentistry and trying really hard to do it, but we all know that revolutions don't start from the top down, they have to start from the bottom up. And so that's why I'm here today, because really we need to educate people as to what it is that we do want in dentistry. You know, we, we need to know what kind of care that we want. A lot of people distrust what happens in dentistry mm -hmm. and for good reason. They can't quite put a finger on it and they want to know that there are better ways and, and there definitely are. So what um, I think most of us both deserve and want is a beautiful wide smile without a lot of interventive dentistry. We don't want it to cost a lot. We don't want to, um, we want it to function for a lifetime. And unfortunately, with the traditional dentistry that we are still taught in dental school and is still in large use throughout the country, um, we don't get dentistry that lasts. And how would you best describe this, this form of dental care that you identify in your mouth matters? Well, there are two Does, aspects of it. Is it given a it. name? Or yes. Okay. Uh, one is called minimally invasive dentistry. And another, and uh, the sequelae for that is called biomimetic dentistry. Okay. Perhaps you can uh, share with us, how, because you're relatively new to the field too. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of minimally invasive dentistry is how that started. You know, what dentist experts uh, developed this, and and what the status of that educating other dentists are about mm. this form of dentistry. Because yes. I think it's an important point. And how many of Dentists who believe in this are out there. Is it one percent? Is it five percent? Is it is it starting to be taught in dental school? So maybe a little bit of history and the current state of the, the that thought as it extends into the profession. Sure, uh, and that's really kind of the critical thing about everything that I talk about. It's all in its way too early phases. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Rainey has been talking about this, and he has uh, lectured endlessly over the last twenty five years. He has written in dental journals. He has spoken all over the and world. Tim is still alive? Oh, yes. He's okay. practicing in Refugio, Texas. Um, and in fact, his practice is almost all Medicaid children, so people who are not privileged. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of this dentistry is that it doesn't require shots. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's mm -hmm. not painful. Um, in fact, since he introduced ozone into his practice, which goes well with the minimally invasive dentistry that we'll talk about, he has never had a child come in with an asymptomatic tooth, meaning a, a tooth in pain, that has ever needed a root canal, has ever needed extraction. He's never even needed to anesthetize them. He has taken care of it all very quickly, very simply, very inexpensively. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, that goes back to delivering what we all want. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of expense, not a lot of pain. 
Yeah. So rather than giving them loads of fluoride and hoping that's going to somehow magically eliminate well, dental decay. Fluoride is, has become a problem actually in diagnosis. Um, before I knew about fluoride not maybe being such a good thing, um, I'm afraid I was traditionally trained and my daughter did have a fair amount of fluoride in her diet and, and topically and so on. And when that outer shell is heavily infused with fluoride, it changes the way an x-ray goes through a tooth. It really, I think it delays diagnosis because we're not able to see that decay as easily. And I think that's a problem with it. And then, of course, it doesn't go through the plaque, which is where a lot, it doesn't go through the, into the grooves of the tooth. That's, mm -hmm. that's been proven by studies. Um, but it also doesn't go through plaque. And people leave plaque, this conglomeration of, of germs and sticky material that holds it together. Uh, it takes 30 minutes to go through that mm -hmm. to even get to the tooth. Sure. So it's important to really understand that, you know, and one thing that I didn't appreciate was that teeth are one of the most complex um, structures in the body. Mm -hmm. It takes a full nine years for them to even form. It's a series of arches. Mm -hmm. um, if you would think about masonry, anytime you cut an opening in masonry, in order to handle the compressive strengths, a mason has to build an arch uh, to hold that strength. Mm -hmm. If you were to take the keystone out of that arch or to cut the leg off of that arch, the whole arch would collapse, the whole structure would collapse. So what I think is so beautiful about a tooth is that, an, an adult molar, is that it is a series of arches. There are at least four to five arches built into the tooth and they're actually made of different layers. So you have an outer very tough shell called enamel that's only 2% organic and it doesn't flex a lot. But the internal part of the tooth, the body of the tooth, is 55% organic. It's made of collagen and water, and it's made to shake, rattle, and roll as we put all those compressive strengths on it. Um, chewing is a very, very tough thing, and we want these teeth to last 100 years and stay in function. And they're able to do that. Mm -hmm. They're designed to do that. They're designed to do that. Um, and so modern dentistry needs to respect the structure of that tooth a little bit better. And so when we're talking about minimally invasive dentistry um, we're talking about first and foremost we have to be able to diagnose early and be um, accurate with it and it's rather sad to say but that studies actually show that using the tradi traditional means of diagnosis dentists are only 25 percent correct and when I say traditional means of diagnosis I'm talking about the little sharp explorer uh, that we poke into the grooves the, the pits on the top of the tooth and x-rays that's, that's not a very good record 25 percent um, a lot of times there are false positives if that groove if that pit happens to be exactly the same size as that particular dentist explorer it might kind of catch and pull on it and he might say that that's decay when in fact it isn't um, but quite, uh, what's much more likely to happen is that it's a false, ne uh, a false negative. Uh, you can have a tooth be completely stain-free in those pits. It cannot stick with an explorer. If we take an x-ray of the tooth, nothing shows up. It looks completely pristine. However, it can be hiding up under those pits and grooves some rather significant decay. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when the tooth forms, when that enamel is forming, a lot of times there are little folds and fractures and not completely mineralized enamel. There are defects in the enamel that we can't catch for, for many, many, many years. Um, so you can't really diagnose or treat an unopened fissure. That's a really first, most important thing, I think, that people need to know. And what, what is a fissure? A fissure is the groove in the top of the tooth. Uh, the pits and fissures, the little wrinkles in the top of the tooth. Mm -hmm. Those are probably the hardest, trickiest thing to diagnose and the one we most often miss. And, and it's important to diagnose these because if there's damage there, that can lead to dental decay? Yes, absolutely, and, and the decay has to get pretty deep into the tooth before we can diagnose it. In fact, x-rays um, are very late-stage diagnosis. Mm -hmm. 
Decay has to be at least two millimeters into the second layer of tooth under the enamel before an x-ray can begin to catch it. So let me give you Sometimes a little... Sometimes like in cancer diagnosis too. Yes. Frequently can uh, x-rays are used to screen for breast cancers, but by the time they find it, it's already considerably advanced. It's it certainly is. not a sc physiological screen, it's an anatomical screen. Yes, and, it, and it, uh, um, then you have to be much more invasive mm -hmm. in treating it. And so you want to be able to catch diagnosis early. The more tooth structure you leave, mm -hmm. the more it's able to shake, rattle, and roll as you chew, uh, the more it's able to function for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you, if you have to cut more than, you know, a tooth in function without a filling can take about 500 pounds of pressure, which is about how hard we chew. If you have to put a filling in that's about a fourth of the width of a tooth, that goes down to its ability to withstand that pressure of about 313 pounds. And then if it's, you know, say a third of the width of the tooth, that goes down to its ability to withstand pressure of about 213 PSI, I believe, something like that. Now, then so what happens if you actually replace it with the crown because it's, you know, you've had the fillings, multiple fillings, and then enough of the structure is destroyed where you have to repair it with the crown. Does the structure of the replacement crown that you put on top of the tooth, does that replicate the initial 500 pounds of force? Oh, it can, it can handle force, but it concentrates it all in one place. Mm -hmm. So let's go back. You mentioned something kind of interesting that, that we should understand. When you, you know, I, I wish we would change the vocabulary in dentistry. I'd like to get word, uh, rid of the word drill, for the most part, and fill, because neither of those really have a place in dentistry, if that's a little shocking thought. But dentists don't need to use drills as much as they do. Um, drills tend to fracture a, teeth apart, a tooth apart. Mm -hmm. They're a straight line way of amputating the tooth. Mm -hmm. uh, they remove far more tooth structure than is necessary. Uh, they don't leave a very clean design. Uh, and they kind of propagate cracks throughout mm -hmm. the tooth. And it's like a windshield. You don't know which cracks are going to propagate and which ones aren't. And traditional filling designs are usually very boxy looking. They're going mm -hmm. to be larger at the bottom than the top, and they're always going to end with a little point. Mm -hmm. And unless you know how to rebuild a tooth correctly to structurally put in the stress distribution pathways, you are not going to be able to do that and the tooth will break down and need repair, break down and need repair. Um, it's said that probably 70 to 80 percent of what a dentist does is uh, to redo old fillings that have been done. But I think what, what precedes the, these technological developments and the dental tools though is the foundation on the diet because if you got the diet right, if you're eating the right foods, if you're staying away from the sugars and the processed foods and the grains, and, and you're avoiding toxins, then you're creating an environment in your mouth that is going to be resistant to dental decay. So that's the very first step. That's the absolute basis yeah. of it. Yeah. And, and I have another really interesting story there. Uh, and this is where it led me. You know, I, I didn't totally understand that in the beginning when I started mm -hmm. my research for my book. Um, it's all about the environment. Mm -hmm. I had, I was given a set of x-rays by my boss and said, you're going to clean this guy's teeth tomorrow. You know, she wasn't going to be there. And I looked at mm -hmm. him and he had two millimeters of bone around his teeth. That's nothing. You know, it's supposed to be 12 millimeters mm -hmm. around the root. Severe gum disease. And uh, my thought was, if I clean his teeth without any backup support, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to possibly precipitate a heart attack. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't want to do that. Um, but she said that's what he wanted. He'd already had a heart attack not to worry about it, which yeah. didn't make me feel all that comfortable. And he and came this is in through dislodging bacteria that are there. Yes, because you know, when, and, and when a hygienist goes in and manipulates the tissue, she's going to start a huge bacterial shower into mm -hmm. the body. Mm -hmm. And this person has clearly had degenerative disease. I look at gum disease as as much a reflection of of uh, internal degeneration as as a cause of that. They, it, it works both ways. Well, would it, would, rather than causing a heart attack, wouldn't they cause uh, be, subacute bacterial endocarditis, typically, which is an infection? It can. Uh -huh. I mean, it does it dash, but does but it, also, you know, it it's going to... It can stimulate a heart attack, too? It, it, can, it can make the uh, uh, 
red blood cells far stickier. Oh. And you know, okay. you start that whole so tumor necrosis clot. factor okay. and so on. So okay. yeah, so it will start an inflammatory cascade that okay. could precipitate a heart attack. Wasn't aware of that. I thought just thought it was the endocarditis. And that's certainly a huge issue. concern. Um, and of course, that was also before I was introduced to ozone. But the interesting part, the point of this story, is that I was going to still try to talk him out of mm -hmm. saving his teeth because honestly, mm -hmm. he was sick, and. Um, the fact of the matter is, he came in and he had no bleeding, no, no, none of the clinical signs of gum disease. It was unbelievable. His tissues were, were like steel. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never seen that in 30 years. And I said, I think your heart attack scared you half to death. And so what you might have done was start exercising, started eating this way. And we had this long discussion about how to eat correctly and everything, and that's exactly what he had done. And even with all that tartar and all that bacteria present, um, his tissues had shrunk down to match the bone level, and you know they were they were intact. You know it was, it was pretty amazing. So it just shows you that you can have inflammatory diseases and turn them around if you. Well, know, the other point down. of that story too is that, uh, which is I think highly encouraging for most people watching this. Uh, because they typically, like myself, have started life under less than ideal circumstances. It's the rare person yes. watching this who's had a parent who understood this of course. and applied that. I mean, they do the best they can. I mean, parents love us, obviously, most of us. <laughs> but uh, they, they do the best they can, and that isn't really very good for the most part, from what we know now, the standard of care that we know now. And, and as a result, we have a lot of damage. I mean, there's a loads of damage. So most every one of us watching this is, is, uh, has significant dental decay and trauma. Yes, so, they do. And it's encouraging to hear that story because it's, it's a motivation to change your eating patterns because that can have pro profound and enormous influence on, on helping restore it. that dental health, even in an advanced case like the one you described. Yeah, so that, you know, that turned around as gum disease. Um, and there are some marvelous solutions to that in mm -hmm. addition to, to that, of course. Um, and that's, that's the whole point of today, too. Okay, so there's early, early intervention that we call minimally invasive dentistry that mm -hmm. depends on early diagnosis. But okay. Before we go into that a yes. little more, so how f uh, many dentists are using this minimally invasive dentistry? Many have been trained, um, but not as many as we need. Mm -hmm. On my website, well, it should be 100 percent. It think. should be, I mean, and, I, I, it and that's what like, I'm hoping for. It doesn't sound like there's any dentist who wouldn't benefit from using this approach. I don't think so. I mean, it's just um, really and, and and to their credit, they just haven't heard of it. Mm -hmm. Again, we can't start revolutions from the top. These dentists are all going and lecturing and presenting, but you know, dentists are comfortable in their ways. We all are. It's very hard to change, and unless. I mean, that's what I'm here for. I'm hoping that the people out there will start requesting that of their dentist. Say, mm -hmm. well, what about this? What about this? So um, if someone watching this wanted, was inspired and realized that this is the type of dental care I want for myself and my children, uh, how, and how, is, there, is there some type of website that they can go on with dentists who are already trained in this? Or even better yet, how would they about, go about encouraging their dentists who they've developed a relationship with and probably have seen them for quite a few years to explore and become trained in this area? What's the process? That's a very difficult thing, but, uh, and I don't want to break people's um, relationship with their mm -hmm. general dentist because really most of them out there really are trying to do mm -hmm. the best that they can and I don't want to sound like they're not. They just don't know about this. Um, well, they can go to my website. I have uh, the first I have a large part of that chapter uh, free on on that, and also how to identify how, how to find one of these dentists. Well, uh, in my book, I write a chapter called uh, "Modern Dentistry: The End of the Death Spiral," something like that. I don't really remember the exact name of it, but um, they can learn and and look at those pictures and and I think get a good well, grasp of could. what it's about. The dentist okay. could. And one of the things that I don't like um, about, say, mercury fillings mm -hmm. is, is that 
there's a corrosion zone that happens underneath that mm -hmm. over time. And because it's a toxic poison. Yeah, it is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the tissue doesn't Perhaps like it. Perhaps the body is trying to wall itself off. It's a clue. <laughs> yes, it is a clue. But as they chew, that compresses uh, the filling because it's still fairly compressible. And again, uh, it sends little shock waves through mm -hmm. the tooth. And not only will it break down uh, at the corners of mm -hmm. the cavity prep, but right right where a person is supposed to floss, right in between the tooth, uh, quite often a little tiny hairline crack will form. And again, because most people don't floss and plaque is acid, every time they chew that little crack opens and shuts and opens and shuts. So they're pumping the acids from the plaque into the tooth and the tooth can decay from the inside out, which is the dental industry has not really realized so much that quite often decay happens from the inside of the tooth out. That's just not the way we're used to thinking about it, but that's one scenario in which it happens. And of course, decay also happens at the margins of fillings, and then of course it also happens under plaque, and you know, we can go into that in a bit, but... Um, yeah, the mercury fillings are just devastating. Well, fillings in general are something you want to avoid at all, at all costs, and you know, my experience, I, I'm sure it's not too different than many people watching this, and uh, I had loving parents who fed me as best they could, but uh, it was full of sugar and processed foods, and I believe by the time I was in high school, I must have had somewhere between probably a dozen and a half, maybe two dozen fillings, and most of those since that time have been converted to full crowns, or the tooth has been extracted, or have a bridge. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty significant mess. It looks good now, because I've, I've seen some really skilled biological dentists, but you know, it just saddens me so much when these simple techniques that they would have used, I could have had a mouth that would have been normal yes and you know it just, it's just it's, so, it's so unnecessary mm -hmm. a lot less expense although you know you know that's that, that's an important issue for many of course but you know independent of the expense just considering the health and the bio biological function optimization because there's so many impacts of having a, a dental structure that's optimized to to, to, to physiology and and function yeah and we don't fully appreciate that. Most people don't. They're not even aware of the connection. And here's the sad thing. Um, of course, as I did the research uh, for my book and realized that mercury was as bad as it was, I you know, was saving my pennies to try to get it out, mm -hmm. and I finally had it done. And that was about three years ago before I heard about all of this. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, amalgam fillings, of course, had caused a cusp to fracture mm -hmm. off, as it will always happen, mm -hmm. always. Um, I replaced it with a crown, and I, now I would call that the circle of death. That is not really okay, the what, best thing because... Why don't you expand on that? Yes, yes because, um, again, the stress distribution pathway, think maybe of a waterbed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you hit it in one place, it's going to ripple out from there, and no one place is going to take a lot of stress. Well, now all the stress is going to go through the outside of the crown, right there to the base of the crown, mm. and all the stress is going to concentrate there. So what happens? So a lot of times, you know, you will have recession of the gum oh. and the bone. So that that is what contributes to the recession. It can. Really. And also, um, you'll get something called an abfraction. It's a little V shape right there at the root What's of the tooth. What's it called? Now? Uh, ab well, it's an abfraction. Abfraction. Yes. Okay. Um, dentists used to say, "Well, you're brushing too hard back and forth," oh. but generally, that's not what it is. It's, Interesting. It's, uh, it's the the flexion that happens, and so that even happens to uncompromised teeth. But crowns, it just concentrates the force. I had no there. idea that that was an issue. But what what is the alternative? Because you know, many people have this dilemma, like you did. You have the the mercury fillings, which is every day emitting toxic poisons into your body, which is rapidly declining your health over time. So you want to have it removed with something. So what, what, is your, what is your suggestion after reviewing this and having it done it personally? Well, um, I also had two um, uh, resin fillings put in and it was done much with the old design mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. So it's not any structurally stronger and mm -hmm. that is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people are, are taking out their mercury fillings and the dentist will just uh, that's why I want to get rid of the uh, word filling because we're not just plugging up a hole. We want to recreate the same stress reduction pathways that the tooth originally has. Mm -hmm. You never can quite mm -hmm. do that, but this is what dentists who do biomimetic dentistry, that just simply means mimicking uh, nature, mm -hmm. um, 
and, we really have and to what we have to do is is build those in in layers. You can either do uh, one of the problems with resins mm -hmm. is that they shrink, mm -hmm. and so um, they shrink in many different directions. And if it's not done correctly, the tooth or the bond will break, and you'll get redecay. It's the same thing as a mercury filling, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. So the well, at least from a structural. From a structural, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, let's just leave the yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave the toxin, Toxic, yeah. toxicology behind, yeah. um, and and that really concerns me. Um, I think it's just really important to to get that kind of dentistry done, and it can be done. The University of Geneva has not ta taught crowns or. Um, okay. For for over ten years. But it sounds very exciting. It's by by medic dentistry, but. So what you're suggesting it? that this is an alternative to a crown? Yes. It's, okay, so it's also an alternative to, um, it's, it's a more advanced way to use resins, let's just say. And a more oh. advanced, we could call resin dentistry, the white filling materials, mm -hmm. adhesive dentistry. Okay. Okay. Because better, better, more accurate description mm -hmm. than a filling. I think so. Okay. And there are principles of adhesive dentistry that dentists should know, but again, most of them don't know. Um, you have to, there are six different ways to put it in to where it can recreate the tooth structure. Mm. Um, and that's a little bit more advanced. I mean, this is not a course in adhesive dentistry, but um, you layer in those resin fillings according to something called C factor. It just has to do with the shrinkage mm -hmm. so that you're not. Uh, you're not pulling too hard on the tooth in any direction. Mm -hmm. So there, it's a way of sectioning the resins, putting them in layer by layer, or using the more expensive um, inlays or onlays, such as the Ceric machine can do, you know, where, oh, so where they can cut them, cut them and, and put them in separately. And that's better than the crown? A, absolutely. A absolutely. Actually, I, I have a number of Cerec onlays myself, but I didn't realize that was the that was actually a form of biomimetic dentistry. And there are several ways that they. I mean, okay. Cerec isn't the only way. There are less expensive. There are other mm -hmm. ways to do it, but um, you have controlled for shrinkage by making it outside of the mouth be the exact shape as what you're trying to put in there, and you mm -hmm. place it in there, and and you don't have those same issues. How how would you use adhesive dentistry? Because that sounds really. Uh, uh, a very intriguing alternative to what's currently being done for most people. So you just you'd have to find someone who's trained this type of dentistry. Yes. A dentist. Again, and, and again, you know, I started off with my website. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Allman uh, teaches that in his six easy lessons. Um, and that's not so to say that that would be the only way to do it, but it's the only way that I've heard of so far. And it, so it's six easy lessons that most. Uh, motivated and competent dentists could easily learn and incorporate into easily. the practice. It's not a big expensive investment in relatively simply uh, learned. Yes, it is. And um, uh, actually the University of Southern California is teaching it too right now under Pascal Manier. So Dave Alleman, University so of Southern there's California. So there's two individuals. So, for, so mm -hmm. uh, a good strategy if you're watching this as a, as a dental consumer is to uh, encourage your dental professional that you're seeing to attend these courses, get the training so that you can have it yourself. Absolutely. And, and not only benefit you and your family, but all the other patients that the, your dentist is seeing. Mm -hmm. And it helps to spread the word. That's exactly what we need. That's what I mean by revolution down here. Mm -hmm. We can only get it um, when people start asking mm -hmm. for it. That happened in cosmetic dentistry. You know, dentists weren't into cosmetic, what weren't into cosmetics for a long time. But when people started wanting it and they started realizing there was money in it, they learned. So, so another component of this uh, type of dentistry that you mentioned, this minimally invasive dentistry, is the use of uh, ozone. So I'm wondering yes. if you could uh, describe how one integrates that into this, into this approach. Oh, I can't believe I didn't hear of ozone f until about a year and a half ago, but it's wonderful. Um, well, you've heard of it, but you heard, you're referring to the application of ozone in dentistry. In dentistry, yes. Because what most of us hear about it, we're concerned about it. It's a dangerous toxic. When the ozone levels go high, we're going to get sick. And so let's talk about that it, first, because pollution. that's really ozone important. Is um, yes. Ozone is actually up there to protect us, mm -hmm. right? That's the important part of it. Um, when they say ozone action days, what they're talking about is that there's a lot of pollution in the air. Mm -hmm. Ozone's um, purpose or one of the, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. It combines with the pollutants 
to let them precipitate down to the ground. Uh, so it gets it out of the atmosphere so you're not breathing it. It's the way nature cleans up the it's air. It's the way nature cleans air. So when they say ozone action day, it's just that they're talking about there's a lot of ozone out there because a lot of these components need to be brought out. So it's a measure of pollution. But yes, people hear ozone and, and they and think, they it's, think the, it's the ozone itself the that's toxic. When actually it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reaction to the pollutants that are in mm -hmm. the environment. But I may also say here that um, ozone gas all by itself should not be breathed. I mean, it, it, you know, there are two... At least in high concentrations. Mm, yes. Because well, it's directly toxic to lung tissue. To lung tissue and to eye tissue. And we are using it close to the mouth, so there are precautions mm -hmm. that you have to... I mean, you have to take a course in it. You can't just start using it. Um, but since we deal with microbes in the mouth, I can't imagine a better uh, place ozone. I use it all the time in gum disease and we can talk about that mm -hmm. but um, right now we're talking about tooth structure and uh, let's go back to that third way that cavities form in the mouth. Mm -hmm. A lot of times plaque just sits at the gum line and you know people routinely miss plaque at the same place all the time. It's mm -hmm. in the pits, it's in between the teeth and it's right at the gum line. So when you see a white spot on your tooth or the dentist points it out, that is a decalcified area. Mm -hmm. Enamel is like a mineral bank. You can mm -hmm. lose minerals because plaque is sucking them out from the acids they produce, but the saliva is there with plenty of minerals to reinstitute it back into the tooth, and it's supposed to be a balance. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you won't have a lot of plaque sitting there, but be that as it may, once you have those white spots, those decalcified areas, you know, the powers that be would have you think that fluoride goes in there and strengthens those, <laughs> which it does. It's a conventional thought. Yeah. It is a conventional thought. But you've lost the crystalline structure. Once you've lost the crystalline structure, it's never going to recrystallize again. It's amorphous, so a acids seep through. Mm. Uh, so once you get to that next layer of tooth called the dentin, it spreads out and the decay just becomes a chemical well, process. So that's an important point. I mean, so if we could just stop there for a moment. because. Point. That is a, one of the strongest uh, justifications or points to advocate strongly against fluoride because it's really destroying this crystal matrix which actually helps protect the tooth. So it's not making dental decay preventing its clay, it's actually catalyzing dental decay. From what you're well, saying. Well, I, th I think that was a misunderstanding. I'm sorry. Um, it, it can strengthen the tooth, but, it, but, but even so, it's not just strength. That's not what it, we're it, after. It's that's just the exactly same thing it. With, with bone density and preventing osteoporosis. It makes yes. them dense and brittle. The, these drugs, these uh, that are used um, to increase bone density by killing the osteoclasts that cause the resorption, you get stronger bone, but it's weaker bone. Yes. Because of the matrix, you need this dynamic matrix that gets built up. Precisely. And say, I didn't realize it was happening with fluoride also in the tooth, and, and it, it kind of puts the circle all together, and it makes a lot of sense now. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful argument against the use of fluoride. I, and I agree. I've never heard before. It, it, it delays diagnosis because it makes this hard outer shell, and you don't know what's going well, on. Well, it's not even delaying them. diagnosis. That diagnostic component is one, but it actually <laughs> catalyzes further decay, which is it's absolutely counterproductive. It, it, it's, it's making things worse, not better. I agree. Uh, and again, it can't get into the pits either. Yeah. But so if acids can still seep into the tooth mm -hmm. and it's decaying from the inside, you've got to be able to get to that to stop it. Mm -hmm. Ozone is the only way to predictably remineralize a tooth. Well, actually remineralize it. It will. Didn't well, it, it doesn't... It doesn't it's a component of the process because what it's going to do as a gas, it diffuses into the tooth. Mm -hmm. So through those little mm -hmm. white spots into the tooth. Mm -hmm. And it can go up to five, I've heard anywhere from two to five millimeters, okay. let's just say. So that's significant when you're talking about the size of a tooth. So the first thing it does, it's going to kill all the microbes in the tooth. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Yeah, that's, e that's well documented. It's a mm -hmm. very potent antibac antibacterial. Yes. Uh, and, and in gas form, that's the only way it will diffuse mm -hmm. in because a lot of people will try to use the ozonated oils and there's no diffusion mm -hmm. that way. But even more importantly is that it denatures their end products. 
the end product mm -hmm. of the end product of bacteria are acids, mm -hmm. and so it changes the chemistry of the tooth from acid to neutral, so that now the tooth can remineralize the way uh, it's supposed it to. Changes the pH, the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of people think that uh, remineralizing happens from the outside in, mm -hmm. but most of that remineralization is actually going to be coming through the pulp. Mm -hmm. So the pulp, of course, is that uh, hollow internal structure of a tooth that is filled with blood vessels and nerves and is designed to give the tooth nutrients, keep it hydrated. And so the minerals are going to come in through the pulp and feed out this way and bring the minerals to that area and harden it. Will we mineralize in the right type of matrix in crystalline form so that it actually provides the function back? Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing. And once it's remineralized, then it's less likely to be damaged again. Yes. So it's uh, a way of actually treating the potential decay instead, instead of actually <laughs> drilling it out. Another beautiful thing is when a person has rampant decay, maybe even gum disease, you can make, a, like, there are a lot of young children who, when their brace is removed, they weren't so good at their home care and they have all these white spots. We can make trays mm -hmm. that completely seal off wow. the whole arch. There's an input of ozone and an export with suction, and we just put it on for 10 minutes every three months. Okay, uh, that was the next question. Is the, what is the frequency? Mm -hmm. Is at some point do you reach a plateau where ozone treatment's not required anymore? Oh, sh oh sure. Um, there are lots of reasons to use these ozone trays. Um, you know, they would only probably need it uh, two or three times, I would say. Uh, when I say every three months, I'm talking about people, uh, I switch subjects a little bit. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who have zero saliva in their mouth, so mm -hmm. uh, their pH is always really low, very acidic. Mm -hmm. um, they're not providing the minerals to their tooth. Uh, they're, they're half the time that they don't have saliva is because any of the five to 700 drugs that cause, mm -hmm. you know, salivary. Sure. Uh, flow to stop and they're highly highly prone to decay and so we know if they're on these drugs they have other systemic issues as well so um, that's where these trays are so wonderful because they can pretty much stop the whole cavity cascade that happens in them well let's talk about cavities for a bit because of course the co conventional wisdom is that there's specific bacteria typically I believe strep mutans is one of the primary ones and uh, it tends to grow in both bacteria and tend to they're, they're doubling time is about 20 minutes or so. So it doesn't take very long to get large numbers of these, of these bacteria growing. Um, and then they form the plaque and they create the environment that, that lead to dental decay. At least that's my understanding of it. And is that Pretty close, yes. Pretty close. Uh -huh. sure it it takes fine. about, yeah, it takes, oh, maybe 19 hours to actually form a plaque. Okay. You know, you have individual bacteria that are swimming free that aren't nearly as destructive as that colony of plaque. All right, so, so you've got the environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we do our dental hygiene and brush and floss and, and all of that. Uh, and in my, but in my specific case, you know, you, you obviously want a minimal plaque. I mean, that's the goal. Um, I tend to be a plaque builder for whatever reason. And even though I, my diet is really clean, because typically that you think a lot of sugars and grains and stuff. Uh, what's made a phenomenal improvement for me is the, is the use of, of fermented vegetables and use of high amounts of beneficial bacteria. I mean, to the point where it's trillions of bacteria, not just billions, but trillions um, that I'm t consuming on a daily basis. And that's made a partial difference, but it's still an issue. So I'm wondering uh, for myself or others if ozone might be a way to sort of get a hold on that, these intermittent ozone treatments to get that dental plaque under control, or is that just something more that's typically used for uh, remineralizing re the tooth. I think that's really interesting because most people with as clean a diet as I know you have are mm -hmm. not plaque builders. So yeah. that's I mean, it's or, just or, or a plaque or tartar. Now tartar is the hard deposits that form as a result of having the plaque there. Well, I think if I go for, I, I have to, I was down to once a month and with this fermented vegetables, I'm able to extend it out to every two months. But if yeah, I go much more than two months, I need a cleaning, yeah. So you have the tartar formation. Yeah. Hmm, it sounds like something's imbalanced, which is interesting. I, you would think so, and yeah. I just haven't been able to figure it out yet, but that's part of the, part of puzzle, the journey. Of puzzle of life and the journey, yes, is to figure things out as you go along. So. Well, I'm getting ready to have braces, and one of the things that I did not want to ever do that for was because, oh, do I really want a flossing braces? N mm -hmm. Not really, but, yeah. you know, I am a hygienist, and I'm older, and so, so what I'll be doing um, is getting some ozonated oil, mm -hmm 
So that's simply like olive oil or jojoba oil, something that through which uh, ozone has been bubbled through. And then my favorite tool might be the Butler Soft Picks, I think they're called. It's mm -hmm. just a little tool that I can dip in the oil and put in between my teeth. Mm -hmm. You can put it anywhere there's plaque. It pretty much melts the plaque off. So really? plaque is the plaque is Interesting. the plaque is the soft precursor of tartar. Yeah. You know, you have to have the minerals in order to. So, it's sort of a, that, there's an interesting other additional component for individuals like myself, like myself, who are predisposed to this, mm -hmm. is to take this ozonated oil, and essentially melt the plaque away. Some people um, are actually brushing with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I might wonder if you are brushing up under your gums. You know, that's something that's actually quite common that people. People are aiming at the tooth to brush mm -hmm. their teeth, and because of all those arches, those curves, there's an area that you have to get under with a toothbrush, that little moat around every tooth, and mm -hmm. a lot of people have not been taught to brush to get up under that, and um, that's just a really critical part of being able to do home care, and you're not going to get it if you aim straight at the tooth. Oh, so you have to come down at an angle. Yeah. Like 45 degrees? Um, a lot of people have trouble with that because they have a lifetime habit of 90, so they'll start off that way and pretty soon get to 90. <laughs> so, you know, what I have is, um, what I've kind of come up with is, as you're brushing across the top surface, mm -hmm. using a traditional manual mm -hmm. brush, leave some of the bristles on top of the tooth and let the outer bristles kind of curve around to the tooth and just jiggle it at the gum line. Uh, that way you'll have a little guidance to kind of help you remember not to go. It's almost straight on at the tooth. And really? Uh, almost almost well. a 90 straight perpendicular to the moat? Well, what I'm trying to do is get the bristles to curve around the tooth and get under there. And I have pictures on my website. And okay. I'll I think I'll have a video up pretty soon so that people because I think that'll be more helpful. Yeah. And okay. by the way, most people build tartar up right by these lower front teeth on the inside. That's right. so typical. Yeah, that's the classic. And you and I both have a, a kind of small jaw, mm -hmm. and we brush like this. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't work there. Ah. It's the same principle. Okay. You so take the, the brush, uh, split the bristles half on the outside, ah. half on the inside, turn it in and jiggle it there and spend some time there. Interesting. Most of us know that we're brushing with a straight brush that's right. a curve. They don't spend a lot of time there. Spend right. a little more time there. All right, that's good to know. That's very good. It's really good. important because it's, it's almost... Basic. It's, it's, basic. it's basic, but yeah. everybody... I've had people stop by the office and go, Thank you. That was the best thing ever. <laughs> okay. You know, it's funny, but... Yeah, it's, it's uh -huh. really is phenomenal. It is. Uh, well, it's like so many things in life. I was a big fan of the Chicago Bulls when they had Michael Jordan in the 90s, and, and uh, he was certainly a world-class athlete. For many believe one of the best basketball players ever, but uh, the, one of the reasons that they were successful as a team is that they had a good coach, Phil Jackson, who was really adamant about drilling them on the basics. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were so good at the basics, and it's the same thing in life. If you, if you are good with the basics, you know that's what. It, I mean, it's it not is. these advanced, crazy techniques. A lot of times, I mean, not that, that um, the ozonated oils or minimally invasive dentistries are not wonderful tools. But if you get back to the basics with the diet and, start and the right type keep of peeling dental back hygiene, the layers of the yeah, onion. then it really then mm -hmm. you get to the foundations, and you don't need the the, the sort of the restorative part of the dent yes. dent dental approach. Yes. So that saved a lot of people. And then brushing with baking soda at night to keep that pH up. Oh, you like that as a tool, too. I do. And uh, I even printed in my book, because so many people have heard the myth that baking soda is abrasive. Mm -hmm. It's not abrasive. Um, water in a toothbrush has an abrasivity index of four. Mm -hmm. Baking soda is up at about seven. And most commercial toothpastes are anywhere from 80 to 120 as far as abrasivity to the tooth. So no, it's very, very gentle to the tooth. And it raises the pH. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe you can just summarize some of the uh, dental, normal dental hygiene practices that would be useful uh, with respect to the timing and, and the type of toothpaste and uh, the, 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 well, you the want simple stuff. The simple yes. stuff, yeah. Okay. So if you can do that. Um, most of my clients brush twice a day. Mm -hmm. In the morning, they're using um, Burt's Bees. It's not my favorite as far as it has uh, titanium dioxide and some glycerin and well, so on. Well, you know, on. we have a toothpaste that doesn't have that. I know you do, <laughs> but and I, I, I wrote once, but I'm not sure where that email got. Um, I wish there was a way that you could put calcium, sodium, phosphosilicate in it. Oh, um, interesting. I know. 
Do you wrote you wrote me that? Well, I just never got. I'm sure email. you get millions of emails, yeah. and um, well, we'll certainly I, I think them. right now there's a patent issue there. But if oh. anybody can break through that issue, maybe you can. Um, it calcium sodium phosphosilicate is used in dentistry all the time as Novamin. It is a very good mineralizer, far mm -hmm. superior to fluoride, and I have pictures of that in my book as well. Okay. Um, it's a wonderful product, and so I have them use that. Is there in the a commercial morning. product on the market with it now, or is it only available through? That's the only one, Burt's Bees. Well, and, Burt's Bees has it. They were able to slip through. Oh, they can't call it Novamin. They have to call it calcium oh, sodium phosphosilicate. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that's why you're recommending there's, it. Okay. Mm -hmm, there's a way. There's there's got to be a way to get it in oh, your sure. toothpaste. Yeah. I'm sure we so figure it out. <laughs> we'll, we'll I'll recommend out. it. If, if they did it, we can do it too. So because yes. yeah, we we don't have. They use it in Europe all the time. Yeah. You know, Europe, as you know, is way ahead of us in in many regards. Sure. But um, so it, uh, the important thing to know is you don't have to have a toothpaste. Uh, that shocks a lot of people. Plaque is removed mechanically. That's mm -hmm. it. So. Um, most people, they brush with a toothpaste in the morning very quickly, but when they are doing something else, like watching TV, like driving in a car, I have them pick up their manual brush and do that little technique. I want them to not have toothpaste on because I don't want it to be foaming, I don't want it to have mm -hmm. mint in it, I don't want them to have any, uh, um, I don't want the tongue to become numb to what's going on in there. Many mm -hmm. of these toothpaste have surfactants and, and mm -hmm. things that keep the tongue from telling you when it's clean. If it still feels like a sweater's on your tooth, it is. So, uh, and also you can tell better if you're jiggling it under the gums. Mm -hmm. So, and that's important feedback for you to know. So I have people using the toothbrush as long as it takes to where the teeth feel nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. And if they want to add those adjuncts, I have them use the, the baking soda at night because that's when, you know, our saliva slows down and we really want to raise that pH. It's going to have a longer and effect. And is the, P, the, the uh, acid environment that builds up, is that related to bacterial multiplication producing the acids? Or is there another physiolog physiological process going on? I guess I'm saying that um, we become more acid overnight. Yeah, maybe it is because there are... They're, they're, are a lot of bacteria in the mouth that aren't being diluted. You know, we don't produce a lot of saliva at night. I, I haven't really looked into that, but I do know that we're always more acid in the morning. And will so the baking soda tend to reduce the bacterial multiplication too? I would say so. Uh, a lot of the bacteria don't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they become desiccated or dry out with the, bac with the uh, baking soda. Interesting. So and how would you integrate the ozonated oil into that? Any time during the day, you know, that so you want to... So it doesn't necessarily need to be done at the time of brushing? Uh, well, if you're, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, that is what you're brushing with. I mean. Oh, you're brushing with the ozonated oil. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. You know, it depends on where your plaque is and what your objective is. Um, it's too expensive for me to brush with it. Um, it can last for months and months if all you're trying to do is get in between the teeth and you're, you're just picking up a little bit with a little pick and putting it oh. in between, and that's where most people miss. Okay. Um, but you could brush with it. People could. Now, here's a caveat. It doesn't taste good. Oh, <laughs> it tastes a little lit bit like rancid oil. So okay. I, I don't mind it. It's, it's right, because it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, and let me just expand on that because yes. these oils, um, they have fats in there, and they're they're susceptible to oxidation. And if you're going to put ozone in it, it's exactly what it's going to do. That's what you're doing. Uh -huh. So that's probably why you'd want an oil that doesn't have a lot of double bonds. You wouldn't use something. Actually, you, you, you know, the more double bonds you have in it, the more ozone it's going to pick up. Interesting. I mean, the whole point. So there are a few people out there who are trying to ozonate coconut oil. Well, it's only 3%. It's fat. Yeah, so it's so not it's going to pick up any. Uh -huh. Interesting. So, because there are a lot of machines, and I've in the process of probably picking up myself, that there can produce ozone in your home, mm -hmm. and you can create this ozonated oil yourself. Yes, and and here I want to say a caveat also. Mm -hmm. Malika and Harris is where I learned all my ozone uh, therapy and dentistry. They are teaching all the uses of ozone as far as dentistry is concerned, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating. But the important part is the machine. Because it is such a powerful oxidizer, mm -hmm. you're generating it. You've got to generate it from from medical grade medical oxygen, grade oxygen. Right? You don't. If you're trying to generate ozone from ambient air, ambient air has 70% nitrogen, and you're going to make all kinds of toxic um, mm -hmm. materials. So, you want to use um, medical grade oxygen, mm -hmm. and so then the whole tank. machine. Like you need cylinder. a tank. Yeah. 
but but you also need a machine that is completely hardened. You know, you have to either you know the hoses have to not be able to be oxidized mm -hmm. as it passes through. A lot of these cheaper machines, you're going to end up with various toxins that aren't necessary. Mm -hmm. So while those cheaper machines uh, may be useful for gum disease therapy and for using in the tooth, the way I've just talked about, mm -hmm. you can't use the more elegant solutions. Um, um, if I had one of the more expensive machines, everybody that had gum disease that I was working on would also probably be breathing ozonated um, oil through their nostrils as long as I was bubbling it through. They would breathe the oil through the nostrils? Oh, I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. They would be breathing ozone that has been bubbled through oil. Okay. That makes compounds that are quite acceptable to the lungs. Is one of the things that we have going on. So when you bubble the ozone through the oil, which you actually produce ozonated oil that you can use, you actually produce a, uh, you filter it in some way that makes it's it filter less that toxic makes it to the lungs. Not less toxic, it's actually beneficial. Interesting. Isn't that wild? Uh -huh. I've never heard that before. Ozone has amazing abilities in the body. Oh, sure. Um, it's, and, and some people, Dr. Robert Rowan is one of the major advocates of that and teaches it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's told me many times he's a, that it's, in his view, one of the best anti-aging approaches is, is ozone. Somewhat similar to exercise, because exercise by itself is, is an approach that will break down the body. But we know that's exactly what you need to build, make your body stronger, mm -hmm. because you know it's the same, same principle. It acts on so many levels. Mm -hmm. um, if you get me talking about it, I'll tell you all of <laughs> them. So, <laughs> no. But um, one of the things that we have a difficulty with is that as we, um, as we clean teeth or as we blow a horn or whatever it is, quite often we aspirate oral bacteria into the lungs. So the same thing. Um, people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, you have to take a lot of precautions when you're cleaning their teeth, and what a wonderful thing would be for them to be breathing the ozone. Interesting. Um, so it's, it's interesting you mentioned, I mean, you really light, lit up quite a bit when you talked about ozone. So maybe just mention some of the highlights and why you're so enthusiastic and passionate about ozone therapeutically. Well, perhaps I should start from the dental perspective. You know, yeah. we've already talked about what it can do for teeth. And mm -hmm. by the way, there are, other, there are many other dental uses for it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It changes the optical quality, by the way, of those little white uh, spots on the teeth that mm -hmm. are, are so aesthetically unpleasing to a lot of people. It can be used for people who have herpetic lesions. So these little uh, cold sores and things like that, you can either put the gas on it or and some doctors will inject underneath that because, and, and 65 percent of the time those never return. So that's a lovely thing. Wow, that's a novel treatment I've never heard of. It's that. wonderful. There's um, a problem with people who have taken the bisphosphonates like um, Fosamax, Boniva, you name it, and uh, they get these areas of dead bone in their mouth. It's a huge osteonecrosis. problem. Osteonecrosis. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, a, it's a major risk factor that I think hardly any physicians who prescribe these dangerous drugs, which should never be used, and my belief should be absolutely banned from the market, that they even warn people about. No, but they don't. I mean, they're trying to kill bone to save it. Somehow that doesn't make sense. But you can treat these lesions with ozone uh, in various ways. Um, a lot of the doctors will inject up under it. They'll mm -hmm. use ozonated oils. You know, they're very again. You have will, to be Will ozone actually it. help catalyze the reversal of this process, or once the bone? It, it will heal it. Oh my God! Yeah, and I it'll heal it rather rapidly. I didn't know that was a solution for that. God. Isn't that astounding? That is astounding. Yeah. And, and, and I, don't, I don't think it's widely known at all. No, it isn't. Uh, so I've been gifted with this information. I can yeah. tell you, these guys are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the whole point of our red blood cells is to carry oxygen. Mm -hmm. What if you could make super gifted red blood cells that could carry much more oxygen? Um, so when you have a treatment, it can carry, you know, the, your red blood cells that you have now plus the ones that you make three months on into the future will all be super gifted. You'll be carrying more oxygen. Um, the energy generators in a cell are called mitochondria, mm -hmm. and in many cells, you're only producing two units of energy for each mitochondria, and it can increase them up to 36 units of energy. So wow. you can really um, crank your energy levels up that by that using it. Interesting. I didn't realize that that may be one of the reasons why it works on anti-aging process, because there's a number of theories on aging, and one of them certainly involves the progressive decline of the function of the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And you make more mitochondria. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's pretty neat. 
And everybody's on the antioxidant bandwagon, mm -hmm. and that's a wonderful thing because, uh, and here's kind of the interesting thing well, about ozone. Well, that's the whole issue, because ozone supposedly is an oxidant, so you take, an, you know, an antioxidants are good, so ozone must be bad, and that's where the confusion lies. There is some confusion, but there's something that happens that's called preconditioning. Believe it or not, your white blood cells mm -hmm. make ozone. That's one of the primary ways that they work. Mm -hmm. They also, when you use it... Is it, it ozone, or is it peroxide, or is it both? I thought it was peroxide they used. I, I, I think it does make, I ozone. think it does make ozone. Scripps okay. Institute, um, okay. I'll have to go back and look at the studies, but they, they showed two different... Because mm -hmm. peroxide is a form of ozone. A it, form. It, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I like to use it so much. It's one of my favorite over-the-counter yes. tools is yeah. peroxide. It's great it's for... weaker, but yes. Yeah. yeah, it's great for yeah. so many things. So, um, But it creates, uh, the, the white blood cells then are able to make a lot of the um, antioxidant enzymes that we need. Mm -hmm. So they become super gifted as well. So they help the antioxidants recycle, if you will. And that's another wonderful use of, of ozone. So, And another thing, um, a lot of people in dentistry um, have TMJ mm -hmm. joint problems. Like me, they have a forward head posture, mm -hmm. and that means that all of these um, muscles are always going to be in pain. Mm -hmm. um, ozone adds electrons to the system, so some doctors will actually inject ozone into the muscles and that just melts away. Um, it's not unlike using a soft laser to uh, deliver uh, those electrons to an area. And I've had both used, and it's just astounding, muscles that have been tight for, for 40 years are no longer tight. And that's, that's terrific. It's a, it's a lovely thing. Yeah. So. so it seems like you've been able to accumulate a, a whole load of Help, uh, tips on, on how to improve health from a dental perspective. And I wonder if there's any other tips that you've accumulated that you'd like to share. Well, just a second ago, I couldn't think of okay how I use ozone in dentistry. I, yeah. I forgot to go into that. Sure. I would never think about picking up a probe or an instrument without having ozonated oil on it because in the pocket, it's going to kill all the microbes in the pocket before I begin to manipulate those tissues. So I don't create that bacterial shower into the bloodstream. So you just dip the instrument into the oil and mm -hmm. you put it back in there? Yeah, I always on my tray have a, a little pool of it. And I do that, it oxygenates the pocket. So almost always infected tissues are going to be acidic, so it'll make them more alkaline. The nice thing for me is that the tartar, the hard deposits, mm -hmm. It seems to break the bond off so much easier. It's just a lot easier to pull that off so the patient is happier. There well, also it's also easier said earlier is to prevent it to remove the plaque. Yeah, the plaque so is also, so again, the, the germs are dead, but the tartar also, the harder deposits are easier for me to do, so I have to do man less manipulation of the mm -hmm. tissues. It's wonderful. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's a, an occupational hazard for trigenesis, the carpal tunnel from doing We get that. so, yeah, we get so sore here. That's exactly right. Um, the patients like it because it slows down nerve transmission. That's a wonderful thing. In fact, we use ozone qu uh, quite a lot on uh, these exposed roots mm -hmm. to stop the sensitivity. So they don't necessarily feel the scaling and root planing like they otherwise would. Um, a lot of times the trouble with gum disease is that the germs have invaded the uh, walls of the pocket. And we used to do a process a long time ago called a curatage, and we would just kind of remove that tissue mm -hmm. from there, but it required anesthetic, it was uncomfortable, it, it wasn't a very smooth thing. Well, the ozone just kind of dissolves those walls off and the patient never feels it. Mm -hmm. And the whole goal of periotherapy, or um, you know, gum disease therapy, is to get the tissues to reattach to the tooth so you won't have pockets. It does this, I call it kind of a Velcro-like closure, it does this with um, what we call fibroblasts, mm -hmm. and the more fibroblasts you have, the more likely you're going to have tissue reattachment. So with mm -hmm. all the healing and the fact that it really stimulates fibroblasts, you're going to have a much better attachment. So I've had very, very deep pockets reattach when I use ozone. Is there anything you in your bag of tricks that you can use for gum recession? Gum recession is a tough one. <laughs> uh, you you can't give, you think I'm going to give you easy ones? <laughs> <laughs> you don't really get gum tissue back. Okay. You know, that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's but what I thought. It, it, potentially stem cells seems to be the only thing that I've encountered. Stay tuned. You know, that yeah. doesn't mean I know everything anyway. So that's, that's great. Um, 
On the subject of clinching, which most of us do, I'm going to take a sharp right hand turn here. Sure. Um, first of all, clinching is a sleep disorder. That's something that most of us don't realize. Apnea is, is a hugely undiagnosed problem that people have. And if any of your listeners don't know what apnea is, I know you've had guests talk about it, but it's where the tongue falls in the a uh, airway and chokes you off so that you don't breathe for 10 seconds at a time. And, mm -hmm. and um, it's, well, let's just talk about me, for instance. I have this forward head posture. I have a very small lower jaw. Mm -hmm. And even six months after I wrote my chapter on airways, I didn't realize I had apnea. Mm -hmm. I don't have any of the typical um, risk, risk factors. Risk factors. Yeah. I don't have the 16 to 17 inch neck. I don't have the gut. I'm a fairly small person. Mm -hmm. I knew I gritted my teeth, but you know, gritting, by the way, kind of helps strengthen all these muscles and keeps your chin from falling back on the airway. So it does help to keep you alive, but it's not the best way to, to mm -hmm. approach apnea. Um, because I do have apnea, which I finally realized, uh, I have a 26% greater chance of dying than somebody without it. That's opposed to someone who has... This is at night when you're sleeping? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. just because of what it does. I can, I can okay. uh, yeah, so it can be at any time because of the whole, um, I'm fighting to stay alive every night, mm -hmm. basically. Now, even if I were to answer all the questions on the Epworth sleepiness scale, I would come up with a zero on that. So mm -hmm. most people have no clue that they have it. And dentists are, and hygienists are absolutely perfectly placed mm -hmm. to, to diagnose it. And I think it's really important that they do. So, and the ba major risk factors, if, if a hygienist or dentist sees a person who um, has the, the uh, clenching of the teeth? And That's one clue, uh, scalloping of the tongue. TMJ problems back here, and there's something called the melampotty index, where you just, when you're doing the oral cancer exam and you look down their throat, mm -hmm. not when they're saying ah, to see what percentage of the throat you can see. And I have images on my website uh, to show how much that should be. Mm -hmm. um, it should be wide open, and most of us don't have that. And I'm going to peel back one layer of the onion and say mm -hmm. that when you see this, I mean, dentists. Uh, dentists treat it with uh, jaw, jaw forward positioners at night, and that's wonderful. But uh, and of course, there's the dreaded CPAP that people use. Mm -hmm. But if you take it back to their swallowing mm -hmm. um, patterns, quite often, if you teach a person to chew, swallow, and breathe correctly, and get all these repattern all these muscles in a therapy called myofunctional therapy. Uh, you will certainly lessen their apnea, and in some cases, you know, it takes it all the way away. Um, so myofunctional therapy is something I wish that more dentists and hygienists were aware of. We will, it will be happening. Um, there are 26 graduate courses in Brazil. It's huge in Brazil where they've done all, all the work. And it's about to happen here because so many of our children are mouth breathers. They don't have a lip seal. They develop, as a result of it, mm -hmm. too small of a jaw. Their, their dimension from here to here is long. Their dimension from here to here is short. Mm -hmm. um, when you have, have myofunctional therapy, quite uh, in almost all cases, the TMJ is much more comfortable. A lot mm -hmm. of these people get out of pain. It's going to be used in, uh, prior to orthodontic therapy and during orthodontic mm -hmm. therapy because Again, if you repattern these muscles and have them work the way they should, and very few Americans really do that, me included, um, the teeth will come in straight, the whole face will form completely differently, mm. your child will look better. And the apnea will tend to disappear. It can, you know, it, again, um, myofunctional therapists work in collaboration for the most part with other, um, mm. but certainly everything improves. It's like the rest of the body. This has to be exercised. What are your thoughts on the use of a, a dental appliances that are spe specifically manufactured for individuals to compensate for some of the, the structural deformities to address apnea? Because I know that's a common Yeah, the jaw approach. forward positioners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, almost always the teeth are going to shift because you're bracing against the top teeth. So a person has to know that that's going to happen. And incidentally, uh, one of the first patients that I uh, 
was talking to about sleep apnea had actually been, I mean, it was embarrassed to say, had been on a CPAP for four years. <laughs> I was like, oh, do you know that you probably have this? <laughs> so um, a lot of times people get fitted with their CPAP, but they don't necessarily get titrated to make sure that they're working properly. Because it turned out that when I sent her to a dental physician to maybe make a jaw forward position her because she didn't like her CPAP, um, her blood oxygenation went from 67% to 98% in three days. So she was carrying a lot more oxygen in her blood and just because, because she was really getting her tongue off her airway. Oh, this is with the, the, the appliance? Yes, she got, I'm sorry, she had an appliance made. Um, so her CPAP really, even though it was blowing oxygen at her, she wasn't picking it up, I think because her tongue was so... It's an obstruction. Ex yeah, obstructing her airway. Mm -hmm. and, um, and side side benefit was she dropped 40 pounds because when you have apnea, mm -hmm. your hunger hormones are messed up and, and uh, she didn't even realize that that could happen. Yeah, but, that's um, that's messes up the adrenals, the cortisol levels. Yes, it's it a does. Whole, whole panoply of dysfunctions that result. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this biofunctional therapy is also something that could be useful. If someone was interested in it, how would they find out more about that? Uh, I'll be making a much larger part of my website uh, having to do with that um, because I, I think it's probably even more critical than anything we've talked about today. Um, I just finished a postgraduate course in it and it's really sad to see all the people who have gone through orthodontics three times, had orthognathic surgery where they mm -hmm. tried to move the jaws around surgically, um, still have pain, still not function. You know, nobody has addressed the muscle imbalances that caused them to need orthodontics in the first place or to need the orthognathic surgery in the first place. So but myofunctional therapy tends to do that. It does. And again, there are not a lot of therapists out there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but Mostly in Brazil, unless you live in Brazil. <laughs> in Brazil, by the way, where the women are beautiful, they use a lot of these uh, simply from an aesthetic point I, of view. My personal dentist is a Brazilian. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Well, it leads them to have prettier lip lines, you know, yeah. it's, it's all nice. So, again, I think that's something that um, uh, you want to watch your children for. If they're mouth breathing, um, you need to get them to someone who can help them with those habits. So. Terrific. So any other tips that you'd like to share or, or closing comments? No, I, I, I think we pretty much covered some of the Terrific. hot well, spots. Really, thank you for all you've done and all you've been able to contribute and really opening our eyes at these really marvelous uh, tools and resources and approaches that can really impact our dental health because it, the, the, if, our, if our mouth isn't healthy, it's really hard to be healthy overall. I and mean, it's a really uh, an enormously uh, important part of the whole equation. It is. And uh, I really appreciate the tools you've been able to offer us to help take control of our health. The solutions are out there. That's the wonderful part. Okay. You know, we know the problems, but the solutions are pretty exciting. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.